I was mind-blowing. Dr. Salim Afshar is a surgeon at Boston Children's Hospital. When he took his own son to the hospital. Now, I'm a Harvard-trained surgeon. What if I was a single parent who didn't speak English? I would have easily have just complied went home. And what would have happened if you did go home? We would have woke up in the morning, went to his crib, and he would have been dead. If something is telling you that there's something off, act up. Can you tell me about the power of intuition? Well, I think intuition is something we don't leverage or pay attention to enough. Um, all of us have the cap capacity to listen to that intuition. And I think the, um, the power of intuition is really enabled when you're feeling at peace and kind of in the flow. And you're able to block out all the noise, all the distractions, and listen to kind of the totality of information around you to drive you. Now, what's difficult it is, what, what's difficult with this is um, it's hard to make decisions purely on intuition. So it's a balance of listening to intuition, but then also investigating. Um, but there's been many times in my life where intuition drove um, a direction and I've seen the fruits of it. I'll talk about intuition from a patient standpoint. As a pediatric head and neck surgeon that focused on rare conditions and vascular tumors, I honored always the parent's intuition. And what I mean by that is you can have a variety of diverse backgrounds of parents. But oftentimes parents do know when something is wrong. They may not be able to articulate it or be able to really describe it. But as a healthcare professional who's serving children and parents, I never allowed that voice to be not heard. There's been numerous times where their intuitions were valid. And I had a policy on my team that if any parent called with a concern, especially if it potentially was due to a lump or a mass or anything, that I would see them, that they should book them within me, with, to see me within 24 hours. Um, they may have to wait, but I'll see them within 24 hours. Um, and Part of that reason of that policy is we're here to serve and help a company, parents and their children in this journey. And I remember myself, my second son, um, one day I was operating, I came home and my wife goes, huh, so, you know, can you take a look at you know, my son? You know, I said, can you take a look at him? He was only 18 days old something really weird. I feel like something's wrong. So she had this intuition of something was off. I took a look and yeah, there was something there. And I was tired. I was hungry. I could have easily said, well, you know, I don't know, maybe it's a little rash or something. And I could have easily blown it off. But the key with intuition is when it's there, you have to listen to it. You have to act on it. And one of the, when I was a general surgery resident, I used to tell my interns and don't ever be mentally lazy, right? Don't do, don't not do something because you're tired. If something is telling you that there's something off, act up. So I said, you know what? I'm going to take him to the hospital, get an ultrasound and just, and she's like, my wife's like, really right now? I'm like, yep. I'm like, and I remember telling myself, don't, so don't be lazy. Let's go. Took him to the hospital. Uh, went to the emergency room. The hospital is packed. And when the hospital is packed, there's no beds available. And, you know, we went in. And I remember the doctor coming in. And I was like, oh, it's normal. You know, just was kind of like, this is nothing. Why, basically, why are you here? And I'm like, well, look, I don't, you know, I'm not sure what this is, but I want to investigate. So then they ordered ultrasound. 
And I remember sitting in the room and ultrasonography is, you know, the gel and, you know, and I can see the images. It's right there on the screen. And I'm a trained doctor. And I'm like, oh, look at that. There's fluid in the abdomen. That's really weird. There shouldn't be fluid there. And the bowels look swollen. And the technician didn't say anything. And then the attending came in, did the same thing. And I remember asking, and oddly enough, the person just ignored me. And I'm like, and I said, you know, I'm like, I know you can hear me. And you know, I can see the screen. So I'm just asking questions. Like, am I, is that right? Is, there, is that fluid in the abdomen there? And, and at the end, she just looked at me. It's like, well, you could read it in the report. I walked out. So I'm already having this like really bizarre experience. So then we go back to the um, room, the emergency room, waiting. And we're waiting for the um, IV nursing team because it's an 18 day old baby. So it's hard to place an IV. So hours go by. I call my wife. I'm like, no, get some care. There's something wrong. Like I really feel something is wrong. So then they do his first set of blood work. And the doctor comes back around 11.30 at night. So this is started at 7 p.m. So it's 11.30. And they're like, yep, the blood looks good. You know, everything has come back normal um, so far. There's no sign of infection. So they want to send us home. And I'm like, no, something's wrong. Look, the legs are now have pitting edema. That's pitting edema is when the when they're swelling. And if you press your thumb, you let go, it, the pit stays, the impression of the finger stays. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, 18-year-old baby, you know, somewhat early. And it was kind of like, I know I was feeling the pressure of the hospital being full. They didn't want me to be there. And I remember being just really annoyed, again, of not being like honored for like the intuition and the feeling. So I'm like, no, I really want to be admitted. There's something is wrong. I know something is wrong. Now I'm a Harvard trained surgeon. What if I was a, you know, single parent who didn't speak English? I would have easily just complied went home, right? Like just it's really hard to like put your foot down and advocate. So we end up to the floor, end up going to the floor, which is inpatient. We're on the floor. It's a shared room. And I remember being super annoyed, but like, you know, this hospital, why are all the rooms shared? I have an 18 day old baby here with like a 10 year old who's in a cast screaming, <laughs> but it's just a really inconvenient, you know, setup. We're up there and then you go through the standard process where again, the resident comes up, same history, repeating the story. So the machinery of the healthcare system. And then around two in the morning, the entire ICU team shows up. They knock on the door and they're like, hi, um, you know, they're like Dr. Afshar, Mrs. Afshar. It's like, hi, we're so-and-so from the ICU. We want to transport him to the ICU. I said, okay, what's going on? And they're like, well, um, his lab work came back and he's in liver failure. His PTINR is nine. So PTINR, it's a, it's a test for clotting. So if you take regular blood and you shake it, it will clot, right? It will become like a lumpy, sticky. That's how you stop bleeding. And typically, you know, you want to, it's around one. If you're at two, two and a half, that's typically um, a level we, we keep at for people who have had strokes, for example, or heart attacks. So when people are on blood thinners, Right, their target number is around two to two and a half. Nine is so high that you can have a spontaneous bleed and bleed to death. So it's a pretty urgent situation. So we go to the ICU. By morning, he's at Anasarca. His whole body has bloomed up with fluid. He's in full liver failure really diet. So he would have died if we went home. We would have woke up and we would have woke up in the morning went to his crib and he would have been dead. And how often are we in a situation where, you know, 
we're not listening to that little voice. Um, and I know it's a, you know, one example, but I just think, you know, there are dimensions in this world that cannot be, you know, captured on an Excel sheet um, or in the EHR, the electronic health record. Um, and I think parents um, oftentimes are on point with that intuition, especially when it's not coming from a place of anxiety. It's from a gut, you know, place. So. And that policy, you feel that's helped you catch things that otherwise you may not have? Yeah. So, you know, the reason why that policy exists, there's nothing worse than being concerned and you get an appointment six months out, three months out, four months out, right? You have to sit with that anxiety and concern. So it's actually just a tribute to like not letting people suffer. They can come and wait and I'll see them eventually. Um, but to resolve that feeling for them, um, that's one. And second, delay of care, right? Like if they have intuition and if there is something there, and again, I have dozens of stories of patients who've been misdiagnosed, have gone through the system, um, because people are not, they're not questioning the data in front of them, the person in front of them, meaning there's a mismatch, right? Uh, a common example is someone comes in and you say, well, I think it's maybe this or maybe that. And you say, well, I think it's really this. Totally reasonable assumption to make, but, then over the next 10 years, that thing, that lesion continues to change, but people don't question the initial diagnosis. So then you ask the patient, like, what is this? They're like, oh, it's this. This is what the doctor. So everyone assumes that's correct. But the behavior is not consistent. So I've had many of stories like that where someone comes in, I'm like, oh, you know, what, what's going on with this? Like, oh, I've had this since childhood. It's this. And I'm like, well, actually, it's not that. It can't be that. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like the crazy one. I'm like, no, there's, there's no way that that's behaving like the way it should be, right? And it's a different diagnosis. So um, I think questioning, and so questioning the data in front of you and looking for inconsistencies in that space. Uh, a quick story about, and again, I'm an optimist. I love the people I work with in the healthcare system. People, there's a lot of beautiful people trying their best, but there are systemic issues that cause challenges for those in that, in that space, right? Um, I have to tell you something about my own grandmother who died in the hospital. She fell, didn't break anything, I had a, like a bone contusion, a bruise. She was having pain. So they said, oh, we'll keep her in the hospital for pain management. Not unreasonable. She was 92 years old. She was overall, I mean, extremely healthy for a 92-year-old. Um, she recently just had some mild congestive heart failure. So she was put on a salt-free salt, salt -free diet. And she was taking one medicine, hydrochlorothiazide which is a um, diuretic, which helps reduce your blood pressure and remove fluid. And so her, her doctor said, look, avoid salt, weigh yourself every day, take this one medication. Right? If your weight changes, let me know. I'll increase the dose and we'll drop your weight with the water, right? With the, with the diuretic. So she was super disciplined. She would go out, get the bus and travel, right? So she was a very high functioning 92 year old woman. So she tripped on a curb, stepping off the curb, fell, didn't break anything, but you know, bruised and was hurting. She had a little back spasm of muscle. So they all oh, will keep her overnight, give her some pain medication. At that time, on the day this happened, I wasn't available. I wasn't around. And um, subsequently, when I went to see her, which was about two days after, I'll never forget, I walked in around noontime, so lunchtime, 
on a Saturday. And I come into the room and I see in front of her a food tray. The food tray was meatloaf with gravy, French fries, and a can of Coke. And me, I'm like, what? That's an, that is so weird that any older person is on a non heart friendly, salt free diet in the hospital. Like, just, you just never see that. It's a, it should be like a automatic reaction. Like, anyone's in the hospital should be getting a heart friendly. Like, this makes no sense. And I asked her, I'm like, how did you order this food? And she's like, oh, this is what they brought me. Now, she doesn't speak English. So the staff would just choose the food, right? So I asked the staff person, who, right, the clinical assistant who filled out. And she's like, oh, yeah, there's no restrictions on her diet. I'm like, there's no restrictions. What do you mean? She's on, she's 92 years old. First of all, there's no one who's 90s who doesn't have any salt like restrictions, especially in America. There's none. The second of all, I'm like, at home, she's told to be on a salt free diet and to weigh yourself every day. And she's like, well, it's not on the computer. So then I asked, well, who's, you know, doing the order? So then the PA comes in. So the physician's assistant. So I asked, I'm like, well, Hey, like, you know, what looks, what doesn't look right about the situation here? And she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I mean, in your years of experience, how often do you see like a nine-year-old person on a totally free diet? She's like, well, she doesn't, she doesn't have any restrictions. I'm like, she doesn't? I'm like, well, what medication is she on? She's on hydrochlorothiazide and she has congestive heart failure and she's on a salt-free diet at home. Why is she not here, right? And the person gets a little defensive. It's like, well, she's, you know, in fact, she is, um, she's dehydrated. I'm like, really? Okay. Based on like what? And she goes, well, her creatinine levels, creatinine is a test that uh, measures the, Kind of functions of the key of the of the of the sorry kidneys. So you know a healthy so if you have a um, higher number for for uh, creatinine clearance, it's an indication of like either um, decrease in kidney function or if it was you, you'd be dehydrated, right? So she's like, oh, it's one point two. I'm like, really? That's an incredible number for someone who's 92 years old. It's like you're aging. As you get older, the function of the kidneys drop. Now in you, I'd say, oh yeah, you're dehydrated, right? We need some more fluids. So they took the data of a 20-year-old, applied it to a 92-year-old in this context. And, then, and I'm like, well, when's the last time she was weighed? No, well, it hasn't been weighed. I'm like, well, she hasn't been weighed in four days? Like you, no one's weighed her? So she's, you're, you're, you know, give her anything she wants, salt diet, and you haven't weighed her. She's like, in fact, we've bolus her. We've given her extra fluids. I'm like, you've given her extra fluids? I mean, you've given her extra fluids. A woman with congestive heart failure, you've given a liter of extra fluids because you thought you were dehydrated. I'm like, when did that happen? She's like, we just finished this morning. I said, and I just got super sad. I'm like, she's going to die in the next 36 hours. You guys are gonna be all over the place. So I'm like, can I talk to the attending? I talk to the attending. I'm like, I am shocked. I'm like, this is intern level, intern level. I'm like, I'm a pediatric surgeon. I haven't done general surgery in 18 years. But the fundamentals are still the same. I'm like, this is shameful. Like, this is her protocol at home. She's super disciplined. And now you're gonna flu to overload her. She's given her oxygen and this and that. This is exactly what happened. By that night, she was on oxygen, she couldn't breathe. She had fluid in her lungs, so she did a direct. She died like in three days later. And that's a total failure of the system of questioning, right? People losing their autonomy say, huh, I see that it says no restriction, but that's really weird. I've never had a person over 70 on no restrictions eating gravy <laughs> and meatloaf and Coke and French fries. Um, yeah. yeah. It's devastating. But these things happen all the time.
And so listening to your own intuition, questioning, these are qualities that um, need to be appreciated and harvested. And, you know, people need to, uh, we need to create environments where um, people have agency and they want, they have, they have the space to question. I feel like this is a drift that happens in larger systems where people say, well, it doesn't matter. It's not my job or um, they stop thinking, right? They just do their part, bring the meal, do this and don't step back and say, oh, it's a kind of weird combination, you know? So. I know you've talking, talked about how parking can save lives, but how do you actually get this systemic change? Because I know there's some issues with that. Yeah, um, you re in reference to this idea that um, that I wrote about parking at hospitals, and although the hospital, um, so in Boston, the hospital parking, the parking in Boston is expensive overall, and to those populations that don't know how the system works that are, um, say, don't have financial stability or concern about costs, I found that they often would try to either find street parking, which is impossible because there is no street parking in the area, drive around, try to drop off and pick up. And inevitably, it led to them discovering there is no parking in this area. We would park a mile and a half away, have to walk to the hospital, end up being late to the appointments, and that would lead to um, healthcare system being stressed, patients being late, and this kind of notion of um, these individuals who uh, tend to be of lower socioeconomic status um, not caring without understanding the context of what's driving some of this behavior. So the facts are true, right? That, for example, Based on the numbers, if you have a certain, you know, if you're taking Medicare and Medicaid, at least in the Boston area, they've done the retro, you know, studies where it's like, look, if you're in that category, you're seven times more likely not to show up to an appointment and so forth. But that's just a byproduct of a system that's not comp that's not accommodating and um, helping kind of resolve some of the misunderstandings. And parking is one of those. Um, we do have valet parking. We even have valet parking at the hospital. But you wouldn't know that unless someone engaged you and encouraged that. Or you just, the assumption is it's in a city, parking. Uh, and they're making choices, right? A $45 parking ticket that after it's valet is $10. It, but even $10 may be a lot for a family who is struggling for, with food insecurity, which is a lot of people um, in our communities that we serve. And so the example there um, is, yes, you can find data and you can drive a, um, you drive a narrative that further drives the otherism, right? Those people, and, and, you know, I think in a profession like healthcare, as well as in education, where it's about service, um, it's our duty to ask the fundamental questions with empathy and kindness, right? Not in a, like, you know, this concept of questions. Well, you know, I'm a Harvard professor. And I often argue, like, look, we're really good at, um, you know, creating debate assassins, right? Where by any means possible, they'll win an argument. But that's not the purpose of questioning, right? To ridicule someone because you ask a question you know they don't know the answer. A question like truly asking questions because you want to know the truth, how to solve a challenge. And I think um, if we don't do that enough to step back and ask real fundamental questions and to discover how to solve them. Um, and then there's also institutional challenges, policy challenges. So with the when I was trying to implement the program um, of like saying, look, we'll pay for people's parking. Please just come to the appointment. Don't worry about it. 
valet will pay for it. There was a question regarding integrity, like, oh, so now you're paying people to come and to have operations, right? Which, again, the idea of trying to remove a, bar a barrier for patients falls in the same bucket as, you know, sending a doctor to Hawaii so they prescribe more drugs, right? It's all in the area of entitlement. So there's laws against that, right? The conflicts of interest. Um, and it becomes like, if there's any potential correlation, it's better not to do anything at all. And I was like, well, let's figure out, like, how do we resolve this? Everything has risk. And, you know, if our intentions here is to really remove this barrier, let's continue to try to solve it. But it takes time for institutions to um, first prioritize uh, projects. And part of it is also to be patient. You also recognize from a management standpoint, there's only so many projects people can work on and prioritize. Um, so it's not that, you know, if your project doesn't get done, you rebel and you're it's like, no, you have to, it has to be a cohesive, unified front working forward. And, um, but I think there's a lot of opportunities where we can address healthcare disparities, ask the right questions, but also come up with solutions, not just pointing out the, the data. Um, so I think we have to, if, you know, one of my, one of my policies at the hospital as well was never critique anything if you don't have anything to add or a solution to suggest. Because it's easy to walk around with an eye of, you know, criticism and point everything out that's wrong. There's a lot of good people trying their best. Yes, this is not perfect, but it's an evolution, right? So you have to have a learning posture. And part of learning is, you know, making mistakes, but have that space of reflection and take a new action. How that process of action, reflection, consultation, study, repeat, it applies not just to the Baha'i process, but to everything. Is that something that you've implemented in the hospital setting? Yeah, so it's a, it's, a, um, it's a practice that we all have to individually try, right? And, and then collectively, to practice as well and you know oftentimes um in the spaces where i've tried to elevate discussions it often ties back to the core values and asking oh is this decision or is this actually coherent with this value that we talk about and asking in a way where we all reflect on it right it's not a huge story like oh is this you know if, if trustworthiness is one of our pillars there's a messaging of this advertisement or is, does this, you know, enhance trustworthiness with our clients, customers, patients, or does it, you know, um, compromise it? And I find that type of questioning, a questioning of like sincere questioning, not a, you know, not a cynical way, um, opens up reflection discussions collectively. And the more you do that, the more people are attracted to it. Um, and the more you start developing a culture, I was fortunate, I was part of an amazing hospital, an amazing department, amazing leadership. So our chairman um, was an amazing, is an amazing person. Uh, I've, had, I had a, I've had a good fortune of being around really, 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 really strong and amazing individuals with strong moral compasses who try to implement practices that are coherent with where their beliefs are, um, they make mistakes. No one's perfect. But when you know people's intentions are aligned with what the values and vision you have collectively, there's a lot more room for forgiveness and continue to move forward, right? Um, yeah, so there's a, but it's it's not a um, I don't I've always felt this organic process of building my culture, with modeling, and with articulation of what we prioritize, and then institutionally developing policies and procedures that supports the conditions that we want to be played out. Um, yeah. Of course, they're informed by 
the Baha'i faith, which values you say most apply to the work that you do? So there are certain um, values or principles that are core to our work. Um, so trustworthiness, excellence, really striving to tr do our best. Um, beauty, when you make things that are beauty, beautiful, there's a sense of, there's a, there's a level of harmony and joy, right, that comes with it. Um, and it ties to quality, experience, all those other things. Um, and then underlying that as well is this really the process is around building unity. And unity is, you know, when we first launched our company, Reveal Health Tech, one of the first things we did is establish the values the principles underpinning what we are about. And what that did is it helped us build a, you know, a base that would then drive the vision of what we're going to be. And that unified vision helped then to change our language and the way we think about ourselves. So that drove this kind of unity of thought across the group, right? We're about accompaniment and empathy and long-term stewardship, right? Like really thinking about what is our role, not move, move away from short-term thinking. And that unity of thought that led to actions that are unified, right? So then we would come up with plans and, and I think that process, uh, it's not a single one-time experience, it's a cycle. And it gets richer and stronger the more you go through it. Um, but it's deeply tied to the, our framework of how we want to operate. And, you know, again, there's so many challenges in this process as you're growing as a company. There's things you can't imagine, but that's what the beautiful part of life is, right? You take these principles, these values, these 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 um, aspirations, and you have to apply it in reality. And that is a learning process. That's a process of reflection and seeking help, um, having a humble posture, right? Uh, and forgiveness. And I remember the one of the highlights of the past year in my company was we have a webinar series that we do. And, you know, our marketing team was doing, started doing marketing on like LinkedIn. I was traveling on a team and, you know, there's a lot of autonomy. So people build, you know, the advert, put it out. Um, so there isn't like this heavy micromanagement side of things. All of a sudden someone on Slack said, hey, I just saw the last advert. And I saw that it says, look, you know, hurry up, sign up. There's only a few seats left. He's like, is that true? Is it a webinar? Is there a limited number of seats? Because I don't think that's coherent with our principles of being like, truthful and trustworthy. And there was a moment of like such excitement for me that it wasn't me that pointed it out. That this was a person who's in our, on our team, owning our principles, feeling comfortable enough to ask that question. And they, I mean, they are, this was a person who's like involved in machine learning, like nothing to do with like the marketing side. So they weren't also like, oh, it's not my de my department. Like, so I celebrated that because I'm like, look, we're going to make a ton of mistakes. So it's not about not making mistakes. We're going to make the mistakes. It's having that space where we all can contribute to that learning process and helping us refine because we're going to have patterns of behavior that are unconscious from the past, from other spaces, other industries. And we'll innocently come in in the you know, need to like just get things done, we may make these little mistakes. And, you know, the, so it became a point of celebration for us. And I was, I, was, I felt really happy 
um, of that mistake. Is that something that, uh, like, as a result of that, uh, other people have seen, like, oh, when we really fortify the values, that's something that we celebrate it. Yeah. So, so yeah, as a leader, as, as you know, from a leadership standpoint, you have to amplify not the fact that we made a mistake, but the behavior of individuals. And so that's something, you know, my partners and I were very conscious of is how do we give praise on behavior and not an individual. And what I mean by that is what are the qualities, the principles at play, highlighting those elements, giving praise for those elements, also, of course, tied to the person, but it's less about the ego of like, oh, this person's so good. It's more than like, oh, you know, I saw this quality and it's really great that we're doing this. And people, and that person still gets recognized. Um, and I think creating that uh, is a really important way of encouraging it. Um, and it's a balance, right? I think praise and um, it has to be authentic, it can't be gimmicky. Um, it has to be not tied. The person is secondary. It's the principles or the action of the behavior that you want to encourage that should be highlighted. Um, second to that is we have this um, meeting on Fridays across our team. And um, recently, so we go around um, highlighting things we've seen up to basically what we're grateful for that we've seen in other team members. And recently, there was one engineer who articulated so beautifully the qualities that they saw in this other individual in handling this project. It was so eloquent and it was so principle driven. It was, I was like mind blown. And again, that just like, it, it just resonated so deeply with like where I want us to be and where we're going. and. Just get, and that's a moment of just like just excitement, right? It's like, man, we have such a wonderful group of people um, trying to be impactful, trying to learn together. And um, so, yeah, th there's been some of those, those are some of the highlights, you know, uh, of this year. When you mentioned about praising the behavior rather than the person, very much tracks with Carol Dweck's research on growth mindset, which has found that, for example, if you tell a student, who's done well on a test. Like, oh, you're so talented. Congratulations. Good job. That's actually discouraging them to put in effort in the future. Whereas if you praise the effort, like, oh, you must have studied so hard. I applaud you for that. Hmm. Then they're encouraged and they exemplify that more in the future. So it's good you've got that. So this company working with technology in healthcare, wondering how do you see, at a broad level, the purpose of tech in healthcare? Well, technology is an amplifier. And it can amplify good processes or amplify bad processes, right? And we have to be really careful. Uh, it's not a panacea. It won't solve everything. Uh, fundamentally, the challenges we have are born out of people. Um, but there is a role to be played for technology. And I tell people, specifically around AI, there are three broad areas that are really exciting where AI has value from a use standpoint, especially in healthcare. See, there's three. One, things you don't want to do. You can automate and now handle the exceptions using robotic process automation with AI that you couldn't do four years ago. And this is stuff that no one wants to do. Right, fax machines coming in, processing of paper, it's things that are just grunt work that humans do not enjoy, it's not uplifting, no one wants to do. Then there is a second category, are things you can't do. These are like predicting who's gonna stay in the hospital for three days, who's at risk for readmission, you know, who's gonna be like this stuff that is there's Stuff that we are, patterns that we are unable to extract with just human cognition, right? You need um, AI to be able to help identify. 
Just because there's so much data. So much data and there are correlations that we would never be able to make, right? Um, so it's, just, it's a fundamentally very different way uh, from a data science standpoint. Then finally, it's things you can't do well consistently, consistently right? And example is this. You know, a four-year-old man falls, fractures their hip to get a CT scan or say it, just some imaging. They then have an operation. But in that scan that they did for the fracture, for the orthopedic surgeon, the radiologist notes some lump. So it's called an incidental finding, a finding that was not the main reason why they had this scan. But in the chaos of having surgery and everything else, that incidental finding, they recommend, they say, an MRI. It doesn't happen. No one picks up on the incidental finding. Or maybe that report is sent to the PCP, but the PCP misses that. So then years go by, it's a cancer, totally missed by the system. When you do a retroactive look, you're like, oh, it was there five years ago. And oh, there was picked up some fuzziness there. They weren't sure and they recommended more imaging. That's hard. And you can imagine AI systems can pick up incidental findings that are already identified by the doctors. I'm not even talking about image reading by AI. I'm just talking about the reports that are dictated, but then can manage that as a project, ensuring that a secondary image is done within a certain time frame. If it doesn't, it gets highlighted. So think about all the tests that have incidental findings. You can create a secondary system that is monitoring and managing all those other tests that have to happen. Um, same thing with like, you know, certain radiology exams, you know, breast mammograms. It's, it's just consistency of looking at the same images. So AI could help, you know, standardize, speed up, highlight areas, and the radiologist can confirm. And dentistry, it's a huge space, right? Because a dentist is a proceduralist. They do their procedure, they do fillings and so forth. They're the business officer, the business manager. They run the practice. They're the radiologist, right? They have to look at the imaging. And today there's companies that are um, way more accurate for identifying pathologies on a range of dental imaging. And I think it's become the standard where, you know, if you don't want to miss, you, know, you may be looking at the tooth, but maybe there's some kind of dark area that's a metastatic breast cancer. Right, it can be captured. The metastatic breast cancer goes to the jaw. It's a it's a it's a high prevalence of it when it does occur, and you know you can't expect a dentist or a doctor who's focused on fixing the bone to be able to like you know uh, um, track everything else as well, and because the imaging has more data than ever before. Um, including like in CT images in the dental office. Now that's very common to have a small micro CT image. There's different fields, soft tissue fields, bony fields. Um, there's a lot more to, to be missed. So I think AI can be really powerful in that space. And zooming into the work that you're doing, where does that fall in? So as a company, we are about accompanying the healthcare workforce, right? So. We look at ourselves more as peers to help accompany hospitals in improving their operational and clinical and their goals by leveraging technology. We work with pharma and life science companies. It's the full range, right? We help them build products that are consumer facing, that help make things easier or you know, improve the digital front door for say a hospital system or now for pharma companies. Or we do internal things, improving operational management, logistics, or develop algorithms for predicting hospital length of stays. Um, so it's a full suite. And the, you know, our model is, look, we, we believe you have to blend the clinical perspective. So we have a workforce of frontline workers, nurses and doctors who are actively participating in those fields integrate it into our software development life cycle to bring that kind of perspective so that what we build is context specific. So we think the clinical perspective is key. The context is key to understand. 
We also have to have technical expertise. We have an amazing technical team. We have an amazing AI business unit who has unbelievable capabilities. Today, in large language models, there's over 600 of them. So being able to choose the right one, to assemble the right tools together to get your objectives met is key. And then strategy, we have to understand and we have to help hospitals and stakeholders meet their strategic goals, right? Um, lots of hospitals are in the red. Um, and so it's really key for them that their investments help them kind of break into the positive just to be able to stay alive. So you can't say, oh, well, we have a project that has a 10 year return. That is not feasible. So if you're gonna help start people in their journeys, you have to have a context of like what's priority for them and how can you build a roadmap that is meeting all the goals. And I feel like it, it's, a, it's a critical thing to have um, across our organization. Are there any accomplishments or products that you're particularly proud of? Um, you know, so I would say the exciting thing has been the magic of develop, leveraging um, natural user interfaces, right? Using la large language models. So we have a client, for example, huge organization. They have a fantastic data science team, AI team, but they kind of grew organically. So we came in, we helped build a machine learning operation platform that enabled them to move faster, do better, share learnings, and have better governance. But then that led to developing a, a brain where all the protocols and all the resources that are internal, this is a huge organization, you can now access easily using this AI agent. And you can ask any question. So you can imagine you're a sales team, you can use it, you're an engineer. So it really helped unlock the sharing of knowledge and discovery of knowledge, right? Removing, moving away from identifying, you know, which PDF I have to read for the protocol. You're just asking it and it points to the actual source of truth internally all within a secure environment. And seeing, you know, because we are a full house, we're not, we have product engineering, we have design people. So seeing it come to fruit, like this beautiful user interface that everyone loves to use and the brains behind it, it's always exciting. So this is that beauty that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I think it's, a, at the end of the day, we have to make people's lives easier, right? If you're a doctor, or a lot, or like, we should be, technology should not be something that's another barrier for you, right? Your life should be becoming easier. And in fact, it should, it should start becoming, uh, uh, you know, more in the behind the scenes. You know, and, and we are moving that direction. There's ambient scribes. And I recently uh, trialed one. It was amazing. It was amazing. This, this, this conversation here would be captured would be organized, would be filtered, and proper codes. I mean, it was incredible how well it worked. So this idea of moving away from computers so that I could just sit with a patient, ask the questions, have a normal dialogue, and 99% of the documentation is done, and all I have to do is look at it, versus what happens today, when I went to my PCB, I sat there, they sat, they sat perpendicular to me, and they type through the chart the entire time because it's not scalable for them to sit with me and then later on write that note. My cardiologist previously was an old-fashioned cardiologist. He had the pen and paper. And he would sit and talk with me and take some notes. But then later on, he would spend hours each day transcribing his notes to the EHR. And I just think it's such a, it's becoming a barrier between us. Um, so I'm excited about this pendulum swinging back where, you know, technology is doing what it's best at and humans are doing what they're best at. So the technology is enabling human connection. That's, yeah, absolutely, right? So that's what it should be doing, right? It should make teachers be the highest level teachers they can be. It should make doctors be the best doctors they can be. Uh, by making it easier to find the right information when they need to find it, but also focusing on the empathy, the human element of caring and teaching as a doctor. You've talked about moving in some ways away from just helping people to more the stuff and systems. 
can you speak to this how how do we address some of these system systematic issues the issue is this today we piecemeal pieces together right like systems inherently are organisms right so systems are almost like a living organism today when we build or try to change a system we try to switch in pieces here and there because of budget constraints and we make constant compromises and we end up with things that are not reflective of the ultimate goal um, and especially around technology that's intangible the people making decisions are often far removed from people using the tools so you have this level of um, disentanglement of the impact of what you're trying to achieve and it feels it, it's disheartening for those in the front line. There's a level of moral injury that people talk about. They feel that, wow, you know, the behaviors of the organization is, to, are, is not consistent with what we need. And I think it's a pure opportunity, missed opportunity around communication and a line around vision. There's a huge gap between building unity of vision and unity of action. And we need to, you know, it's not just a series of posters in slogans, it has to be coherent across. And if there's any any one of those areas, there's a failure, you have to be disciplined in dissecting out why. Why are our actions not consistent? It's well, maybe your thoughts are not. So you have to discover like, what are, how do we think about this? Is our perspectives different? And if that's off, it's like, well, what's our vision? What's your vision? And we don't, we don't, I don't think we have a culture today that amplifies that process. Um, so what I mean by moving around systems and the stuff, I think we're so focused on the material fixes, like, oh, we'll hire this, we'll do this here, that we're not having the actual discourse that we need that will naturally then allow us to take actions to evolve the systems we're in. Do you think those big shifts can happen or... Does it have to be modeled from the ground up? So there is a intertwinement between individuals, the organization, and the institutional policies. And yes, you need leadership that's brave to make changes in the at the leadership level, as well as the management level. You also need individuals willing to be vulnerable and be part of that growth. And these systems have to all work together and in, in, in create that kind of atmosphere. If one of them doesn't want to comply, the whole system fails, right? So you know, I think of Boeing oftentimes. Boeing had decades of experience of a proud, proudful, prideful organization around engineering excellence and and clearly there's a time point where at the board level, the financial strategy was such a priority that it overshadowed their values around excellence that led to management creating conditions where other people would then make decisions that were not align with their vision. So that's a type of entrapment, right? We all have different levels of resilience around our moral compass. So if I create con conditions that constantly test everyone, some people will break and will go and deviate, even if though that's not the position they want to be in, but they feel the pressure and I feel like that it's, that's pretty common. We create these really difficult environments to do the right thing. What we need is environments that encourages people with free will to make the right decisions. All right, so it's not just a set of rules. So it's not, it's not policing, but it's an environment that encourages the right decision and amplifies that. Um, and then secondary, Boeing also then handled the whole process right by not being truthful 
because that was a, again, economic decision. And, and that's really disheartening, right? But it shows the vulnerability of an organization who can have decades of performing with such honor and like, you know, there's such a level of pride of being engineers at Boeing and how fast it can go away. Um, and I think everyone, every institution should reflect on that. And leadership is really paramount, but, but leadership also is fleeting, right? It can't just be dependent on, on a leader that's so inspiring that people rise up and then when that person leaves, it falls away. You have to have systems in place, right? It has to, it has to be disseminated so there's ownership of this uh, by the people in the system. What makes you optimistic about the future of healthcare? What makes me optimistic is people, right? I've seen transformation at many different levels, individuals. And yes, there's a lot of hard things happening. But I have faith that people want to be good. And in the right conditions, people can rise up. And I think we're at a breaking point where people are seeing that something has to change and there will be that that passion that today without without a proper avenue could lead to you know resentment and anger and divisiveness that same level of passion can be redirected towards a unit division that's exciting and empowering and i think what excites me there's a huge opportunity to rethink how we care for communities, to focus on wellness, leverage the technology to help augment that, but also restructure institutions, restructure how the incentives are. And um, I was recently talking to someone who called me to get advice on negotiating a salary. And I asked, why are you negotiating salary? Like, what do you mean? I'm like, are you happy? I'm like, oh, it's the best job ever. Would you ever want to leave? No, this, this is my dream job. Like, so why are you asking for like $10,000 more? Like the hospital is struggling, right? I'm like, you know what happens is like every time you ask for money, they're seeing themselves, okay, it's increased cost. And they have to think about how to operate. And I'm like, would you, what, what would you rather do? Would you rather to be able to evolve at this level? Think about what else besides money will bring you joy. And the person was so surprised and was so it was was so refreshed. Was like you're right, actually, I want to be able to do this. Like so, think about what like you know what value can you bring to the hospital to the community you're serving, and that's your equity. You say, look, I want some time because I have an idea to make life better. And yes, you know I can either get ten thousand dollars more. Or you give me time and space to do this project where I think I can make some transformation and impact at a level that others don't see. So I think there's a, um, I think, and and, and I'm not saying, you know, there isn't pay inequities and so forth. Um, But I think this person's salary was well, like they were comfortable. But they were in such a habit of like, I just need to negotiate. That's the next thing you do. We just need to keep negotiating. But we don't question why. Like, why? You know, doesn't does that really bring you joy? Is that the thing that you need? Is that, that's, not, that's definitely not the thing they need. Um, so I think this idea of like questioning patterns that we kind of get used to or assumptions that we make. Hmm. Doing that to lead towards joy. I think... That's a great place to end things. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.